introduce the team that's here and all the folks that are here to support any questions or any concerns that you might have, um, whether it's now or in the future. So first I'll start with, to my right, is our Civil Engineering Director, Mr. Richard Trevino. And his role here is he's responsible for all of our civil engineering um, folks and all the, all the responsibilities associated with that. But Military uh, Homes, the, our organization that connects us and the military to Balfour Bay, Beatty's communities falls directly under his directorate. So um, James Fisher, who many of you probably are familiar with, uh, works for, he's in the back there, he's raising his hand. If you haven't met him personally, he probably sends you emails every now and then. Um, but he works directly for Richard and uh, Richard works directly for me. Okay, uh, to my left is our uh, installation commander here at Lackland, and that's Colonel Scott Thompson. Hopefully many of you have gotten uh, to know him over the last couple of months since he took command back in the, uh, in the summertime. And then we have our Balfour Beatty team. So if I could have you all introduce yourselves, and then also can you introduce your team too? Oh, sure. No, that's all right. Thank you. Um, good evening. Yeah, my name is Ty McPhillips. I'm the regional project director uh, for our Air Force portfolio, and I um, office in uh, live in San Antonio, so an office here at Lackland. We get to work with him quite a bit. And I'm Allison Brady. I'm community manager for Lackland Family Homes, and I can introduce the team back there at the table. We have Suzanne Farr. She's my assistant community manager, and then we have Serena Bull. She's our leasing manager. And then over here, we have the rest of our maintenance staff. We have Brian Masella, he's the facility director. We have James Barrow, he's one of our maintenance supervisors. And then Greg Minor, he's our other maintenance supervisor. All right, I also want to introduce Colonel Beach over here to my left. He works for the Air Force Civil Engineer Center. So uh, we all have bosses, and he is one of our bosses. He actually, um, has the portfolio for housing at the Air Force level. So he not only is responsible for Lackland, but many other communities across the Air Force. So they have a, a lot of the concerns and they can capture lessons learned. And he's got a couple of slides to show today as well. Um, and then we also have Lieutenant Colonel Skinner right here to my right. He's from the 59th Medical Group, so uh, medical wing, I should say, and a, a squadron commander over there. He's responsible for all the blood testing, the lead testing, um, in, the, in the water, in the blood, anything that's related to your health, um, mold, all those kinds of things. You know, he's, our, he's our guy. He can help us answer a question or point us in the right direction. Is there anybody else that I've forgotten? We're all, otherwise everyone is either a resident or part of the team. In the front row here, I've got Chief Lantain. He's our command chief. Lieutenant Colonel Whitehead, he is our security forces squadron commander for Lackland. Colonel Field, he's responsible for uh, Fort Sam Houston, but also all the force support activities across uh, Joint Base San Antonio. Mr. Merlot is our civilian deputy director for the installation support group here at Lackland. So that's everybody. We've got a lot of folks here that are ready to answer any of them. I'll just introduce myself yes. too. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Benz. I'm the deputy at the legal office here. If you had any questions for legal. One of the most important people in the room. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Benz, he's been wonderful. He's been helping a lot of our families who are going through a dispute resolution process. Um, that's that's an option for everybody here and you have our legal team if you weren't able to come to one of the workshops then we can connect you right now or after the, after the meeting. So with that I want to turn it over to Mr. Trevino. We have a couple of slides we want to go through. It's mainly just to show you what's, what actions that we've taken um, from the government side and also from Balfour Beatty side and then we'll get into your questions and concerns. So with that I'll turn it over to Richard. Thank you ma'am. Can y'all hear me? Nope. I'll try one more. How about now? So again, thank you all for coming this evening. So again, I'm Richard Trainer, I'm the Civil Engineer Director. What I wanted to do was give you a quick update uh, as a result of the actions that we've taken so far, and in particular give you a, an update on what we did in terms of the surveys. So if you remember, we basically did a, a survey through a Richard. I don't think I can hear you. Maybe you, you can hear me? There, I don't there you go. Okay. If you want to grab your hand, I'll mic you to do that. Too. I'll do that. Thank you. I probably should. How about now? <laughs> Great. Thank you. I promise not to drop the mic. Um, so when we talk about the surveys, what I wanted to do was you know, give you an update. When we did the surveys, we, we should have received basically the surveys twice. We should have seen it as part of an email 
You should have also seen it as part of a hard copy. So if you did not see the survey or if you're not aware of what I'm talking about, please get with us after this. What that was is that we asked each of the residents a basic survey that says, what are some of your concerns with your house? Then as a result of that, we took the results of that survey and we worked with BBC to start tracking those issues with your, with your respective unit. When we looked at the 870 surveys that were submitted, we had about 150 come back. And as a result, that was our first starting point in addressing the concerns. What we also did, and you should have received, now also a telephone call just to make certain that if you did not return the survey, you still wanted to make certain that you still had an opportunity to address your concerns, even though you may not have had thought that there was no issues with your house. That was still okay. And when we did that, we had out of the 720 in contact, about another 113 surveys were created as a result of that. So every one of those were tracking literally by resident or working with BBC literally on a daily basis to track each of those to make sure that we're getting resolution on your concerns. So the surveys, at this point, if you still want to do a survey, by all means, please let us know. We have our housing folks in the back. We have Elvira. We have Francis, we have James. We'll still do that. We'll set up a time and we'll just take your information. Any questions on the surveys? What we also wanted to do as part of the survey, so out of the original, so out of those 260 plus surveys, we also asked the residents, did you want a health and wellness visit? Out of that, we had, we had 24 residents ask for health and wellness visits. That means you were gracious enough to let us go into your house and you were able to show us the concerns. And that allowed us to go in and provide a little more detail to BBC, specifically on your concerns associated with your housing unit. And that was also put as part of our tracking system and work with BBC. That way, it was able to allow us to go in, help create those work orders, help create some resolution. What we also have done as a result of that is each one of those issues, we are tracking that. We work collectively with BBC and my staff as well as their staff Every single day we go in and we look at it. Even to this point, if there's issues that continue to come up, we're still tracking. Working collectively to meet your concerns to get resolution. That's what we've been doing to make sure that your issues are being addressed and that things are not falling off the plate. That was our commitment that we made to you at the last town hall. In addition, there were some things that we needed to do outside of what BBC did. So one of the things that was brought up as part of your concerns were pest management issues, not really associated with the house, but outside the housing unit. We have control of that. That's my responsibility. So what we did is we actually, so feral hogs was one of the things that was brought up. We actually, in fact, installed hog traps on the back side of Herman Scott Village, along that area, as part of our natural resources program, and we started to trap the hogs. So we've caught about six for now. We're gonna to continue to do that for perpetuity until there's a reason not to, but we believe it'll be a constant action for us. So hopefully you'll stop seeing, or at least see a minimization of those types of pests within the housing area, because that's what feral hogs are. By definition, they're a, they're a pest. So what I want to also go through is, this is a summary of the findings or the concerns that we got from the surveys. When you look at this, the investment of the, in terms of the five-year sustainment plan, it's, it's open communication about what is the plan in order to capitalize the housing units. That was one of the concerns that was consistent across all the surveys. Having that transparency, having that openness to know what is, what is their plan to fix the units across Blackland Air Force Base. Houses not being ready when you turn them over. When you move in, they're not calm ready. That was a concern. And then, especially if you see a house unseen, you expect the house to be ready to be moved in. The work order process, concerns were that certain things weren't being done, and therefore I would send a work order or submit a task order or work order and thing wasn't being done. If it was being done, it wasn't being done to my satisfaction. Doing band-aid fixes instead of full repairs. If I have a leaky toilet, fix the toilet, don't come back and come three, four, or five times, fix it the first time, fix it right the first time, so you don't have to keep coming back into my house 
and doing the same repair over and over again. Poor, you know, poor coordination between the contractors and the residents, going back to, if you're gonna do a work, let me know you're coming in. If you're gonna do the work, I wanna make sure that the work is satisfactory done. You know, those types of issues, because again, you wanna minimize the contractor coming into your house multiple times. Pest management, that was an issue in terms of do I have not just the feral hogs, but it was the snakes. It was, you know, the, the cockroaches, it was the bugs, it was the ants. Looking at those issues from the housing perspective. And also HVAC and duct cleaning was a big issue and that was the moisture issue. That was consistently one of the major themes across really all of the surveys. It was more a common theme than anything else. Any questions? Next slide, please. So we also, we have, as General Lindman has indicated, uh, we did have two legal workshops and we hope that that was beneficial to give us an opportunity for you to know, you know what, your, what the process is, what your rights are, providing that legal assistance to make you more aware of what you can do. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Colonel Skinner to talk about the, the medical piece. Good evening. A uh, Couple of quick things. Uh, one, the water is great here on, on Lackland. Uh, it's a great thing to have. Uh, we did institute a blood lead level testing program last summer uh, due to some concerns, and this was JBSA wide. Uh, the results of that have been great. There has been nothing that is of concern from that program uh, and the over 800 tests that have been done across JBSA as a whole. Uh, so the last thing I have for you is to make sure that if you do have health concerns, bottom line is that's what your PCM is here for, and we provide that. So please make sure you go see your PCM if you have health concerns, regardless if it is related to uh, what you think to be a housing problem or anything else. If you have health concerns, uh, we're here to take care of you. Thanks. Can I add that? Sure. What? Yeah. All right, so if you do have health concerns or you think they may be related to the home that you're living in, um, in addition to going to your PCM and making sure that you have everything you need to be healthy, um, make sure you let us know. Uh, there, sometimes there's a breakdown in terms of they, people have a doctor's orders or they have a doctor's uh, uh, results, but we don't always get that information, and that's really helpful for us um, to help you to work with Balfour Beatty, to work through our legal process. Um, if you're not comfortable sharing that information, that's completely understandable. Um, but if it's something that you want resolved or you do want to make sure that it's an HVAC issue and you think it's related, uh, your health issues are related to the HVAC, then um, it helps if we have that, that PCM, um, their, their uh, assessment of the situation. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. So, Colonel Mike Beach, I'm the, uh, the vernacular, right? I'm the Air Force housing guy, right? So. All of the Air Force's housing privatization projects are in my portfolio. All of the permanent party dormitories are in my portfolio. And uh, the overseas housing, you know, if you've ever been to Kadena or Europe somewhere, those homes, that is all now in my portfolio, right? So we are actively working to ensure, right, that those homes are healthy and safe for all of our members and their families. And not, not just Airmen, but you know, joint service as well. But if, we're, if I default to Airmen, I'm sorry, I, I can't help myself. The, uh, so as the you know, as the issue kind of emerged over the you know maybe the August to uh, January time frame, you know, we kind of had a crystallizing moment right around the end of January, and the uh, you know Big Air Force said no, we got to get our arms around the issue. So so what did what did Big Air Force do? Right. So the you know the chief and the secretary, right, very top levels in the Air Force, directed the 100% Commander Health and Safety Survey. The other services have a companion, uh, you know, being the three services, no one's going to do it the same, right? So uh, they all have the same spirit and intent, but we all went after it in a few different ways. But the overall intent was, you know, commanders and leaders talking to members about the health and safety of their living quarters and ensuring that their families had a, you know, a healthy and safe place to live. The also, you know, we had some some bases. You know, this is a big portfolio, right? So there's a uh, a spectrum of performance across the board. So the chief and the secretary went to personally went to the places where the problems were reported to be the most significant. You know, Tinker Air Force Base, McDill, Keesler, Those are the ones that 
were in the news for uh, exceptionally poor performance and exceptionally poor conditions. So they personally went to those sites. Also, you know, the congressional staffers, you know, asked us a ton of questions. They went out to the to those problem sites and to places in their own districts, right? So the the Congress members and their professional staffers, the Armed Service, both of the House and the Senate Armed Service Committee professional staffers, you know, were driving a lot of this, right? So this is all kind of in the month of February, right? So there's really a lot of uh, attention being brought to the problem. And then, you know, we also had, as always, right, any military member has, the, right, there's three people you can talk to without very reprisal, right? You can talk to your commander. Commanders will say, please let me work, let me work the problem first, but you always have the option to go to the IG and your congressman, right? So people were doing that. So, you know, they wrote to their congressman, they had, requests for information about the status of, in some cases, very persistent maintenance problems with their homes that the owner wasn't getting after, et cetera, et cetera. But those complaints took many forms and were on a spectrum from not so bad to you know, absolutely terrible. And then OSD and Air Force IG complaints. And then the last one there, the IG investigation. So the that was inward, inwardly focused. So the Air Force IG, they haven't published a report yet as far as I know, uh, but they did a, essentially a month-long study of how the Air Force manages its privatized housing portfolio, right? All of ours, so it was really an IG inspection of my office and my folks and the secretariat level people that we report to in terms of how do we ensure that the owners are doing what they're supposed to do and that they're complying with their end of the project documents and we're complying with our end, et cetera, right? So that that report is due out any day, but it's not out, at least it wasn't out as of five minutes before I stood up. So those are all the things we did to get our big Air Force did to get our off drawing problems, right? So what emerged, right? And this is kind of a uh, kind of the bigger view, right? Like the General Linderman and company, they just kind of gave, right? The this is the tactical of a view here at Lackland. This is kind of the big Air Force view. So this is more of a you know, fifty thousand foot. You know what did we what are we doing, right? So starting off empowering residents. Uh, as it happened, you know, like I remember back in the day when it was government housing, we just kind of intrinsically knew as service people, just like if you have a problem with the, you know, any customer service agency, right? You know, I can talk to my boss, who can talk to our commander, who can talk to the commander responsible for that, who can make change because I got bad service at whatever, right? And we kind of, uh, in this privatized arrangement with, you know, with a lease and their blah, 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 right? We kind of, uh, that became blurry. And uh, also, you know, over time, as you guys noticed, right? Uh, maybe some of you are here because of this, right? Work order visibility, right? Do, I call my work order, do they come? I'm not sure, et cetera, et cetera. So work order visibility is a problem. And also legal assistance. We kind of stopped referring people to legal assistance thinking that, uh, that that was a step towards litigation when it's really not, right? the legal assistance attorneys are providing legal assistance to a member, just like you would in any other dispute or any other matter you will. It does not, they, the judge advocate office is not going to sue the owner on your behalf, right? They, they will advise you of your rights. You may decide to seek counsel and sue the owner, but they're not gonna do it yourself, right? So there's a uh, fundamental misunderstanding of the purpose of the JA. So we're reestablishing that now and then we have the 800, the 1-8 number helpline. Has everybody heard about the helpline? So now there's a direct line that rings in my office, right? The, not my personal office, but with my folks, right? And uh, you know, that's a duty phone and our personal will answer and we will work your issue to, to closure, right? So. Do we have that actual number? Uh-huh. It was just puns, right? I wrote my hand. Oh. The, uh, <laughs> it's like I planted that, she's my straight person. So the number is 800-482. Six four three one. I never call it because I know the person that answers it, so I just I have an issue. I just go talk to her. But the uh, so I wrote it on my hand. So I, uh, one more time, sir. 6431 We'll post these online and um, we'll make sure that you get them. But we'll, we'll add the number to the slides. So that's the you know, we want to put we want to make sure residents know that uh, that you are empowered, right? Just like you're empowered. At, do any other, if you are receiving substandard service, right, you are empowered to engage and uh, get the service where it needs to be. So moving on to engage leadership. So also we're uh, 
revamping our training of commanders and uh, first sergeants, right, and, and helping agencies as far as, you know, these are the avenues that we have to still exert influence and support our members in these housing projects. So, you know, we have the quarterly commander evaluations. We'll be standardizing those, you know, the dispute resolution process with uh, commander involvement uh, is, if you, well, I think these leases already have it. You know, one of the, and then uh, revising, so the manager review committee is a, a management structure that we use to kind of operate the projects quarterly it meets, generally speaking, or every six months. But if we, we talk about the budget, we talk about, you know, what's going to happen in the next period, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll, we'll use that, we'll leverage that structure as a recurring meeting to uh, in, ensure the right leaders are, have eyes on the problem, to use the, the chief's word. One of the things I say, you know, like the, there's 32 HP projects, right? And these are 32 handmade, handmade wooden shoes, right? They're, they are all individuals. So, because they were all deals closed over a 15 year period. So, as you move around, some of you have been around a long time and maybe have lived in more than one project, you know, these are, that's not a standard experience, right? So we want to get to a standard experience where there is a, the dispute resolution process here would be the same dispute resolution process you would use at Keesler or at McGill, right? But the way it is now, that's not how it is, right? You, you do the lack on one, you can probably go to Randolph and they probably have a different one, because that's a different one. So, uh, probably more than you want to know. Any questions on this part? I got one more slide. And then the, uh, the rest of it, improved oversight. So, these are all kind of uh, big issues we're looking at for the whole portfolio. Got to call your, my atten your attention to the uh, adjust operating budgets to reflect additional scope. You can probably appreciate my problem. I can tell you're all jealous. You're like, man, of course, housing guy. What do I have to do to have that job? The, uh, <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> but so from a portfolio perspective, right, these are 50 year transactions and we want to make sure that these homes are available in year 40 and they're suitable for folks to live in, right? So the way, so we've been really focused on ensuring that there's money available in the out years, right? But in some cases, perhaps that was at the expense of current ops, right? So we want to, we'll be shifting the balance to put more emphasis on day-to-day -day current ops, right? To uh, focus more on keeping the homes nice today. We may have uh, contributed to the problem by kind of focusing too much on the keep, keeping the, home, the homes nice for tomorrow. Like, well, you know, that's great for my grandkids, but you know, I got problems right now, so we'll, we want to get after that issue, right, and kind of shift the balance there. The, uh, as far as news you can use at the local level. And our communication and feedback processes, you know, one of the couple of consistent th deals we get is the, uh, as our population is over-surveyed, right, so, and I think military people, generally speaking, we are over-surveyed, right? Uh, good Lord, the dental corps, not, not, not I hate them, just saying, right? The, uh, every time I go to the dentist, like I, very soon after I get a letter, I get a phone call, like I get three modes of contact after I get my teeth cleaned about the dentist. Uh, and, and we're kind of getting feedback from the customers that it, it's kind of like that when it comes to maintenance, right? Like I just had them you know, fix my doorknob and now I got to answer three freaking surveys, right? I would have fixed the doorknob myself if I didn't have to answer the stupid survey, right? So we want to consolidate those. But the, the, the flip side of that is the survey data is really the key to how we make decisions about investing, right? So your, your participation in the survey is very important. And then the other piece there, work order visibility by a half. So apparently, you know, the, in the off base market, there's a deal where you can like, Mr. Henderson, who's our political appointee, he lives in a rental in DC. And he's like, oh yeah, my house, you know, I. I have an app that has my house in it, and I say, you know, the main bathroom has a leaky sink, and I do that on my app, pick that up, and and I get a work order number, and it's almost like Amazon, like my package, like I know my package just left St. Louis, oh, now it's in uh, Kansas City, oh, now it's, you know, so kind of a similar thing, where here's my work order, oh yeah, it's been dispatched to the shop, the tradesman is on the truck on the way, right, kind of give you a little status, and uh, and that way you know that it's in there, and it's now just not a, well, I called, and the operators seem distracted, so I'm not sure if they actually wrote my stuff down and it's been three days. You know, you, you kind of get into this, I'm not sure if it's in there or not, right? So we want to automate that process if we can. Then the, the bottom part there, kind of more in the news you can use be uh, part of it is 
want to get to a common lease, so they should move around the Air Force. The leases should look pretty same. They're not going to, I want to set expectations. Each tenant, landlord tenant law is state based, so it's not going to be the, the same everywhere you go, but you should see similar things as you go from state to state. The uh, mold moisture policy and education, right? So there's a there's kind of a vacuum, especially in the privatized housing space in terms of, I think I have a mold problem in my house, but I'm not sure, right? If I, if I can see moisture, then yep, we can get after that. But if I'm concerned that there's moisture behind that wall, or I'm concerned that, uh, that this uh, moisture is still in the house, even though it's been fixed, and, I, and I'm having a reaction, right? There's a there's a policy piece in there that needs to kind of tell all the areas how they what, what to do, right? The Surgeon General needs to know what to do, the engineer needs to know what to do, the owner needs to know what to do, and there's kind of a, a, a policy vacuum there, and it's kind of a, <coughs> depends on from site to site how well they get after those issues. And then the last one there, so the uh, eliminate taxes, that's probably, you probably like, who cares, who cares about taxes? But the, so as I mentioned before, right, we, we need them, the only money that goes into these projects is our housing allowance is the rent that, that you pay. And funds accumulate in, a re, in, in an account from, the, you know, from today that get used in 20 years to buy that new roof or to fix the house up. And in some cases, depending on the business structure of the project company, right, we could be taxed when we pull that money out. So there's a, you know, a 40%, that means we have 40% less dollars to, to do improvements because I gotta pay a 40% tax rate because that's now being recognized as income. Five more than you wanted to know, but nonetheless, a big deal, right? Forty percent of uh, ten million bucks, right? That's you know, four million bucks public lands, right? The uh, and four million bucks goes a long way towards uh, fixing up houses, right? So, so that's a significant legislative lift for us. I think that that's my last slide. Do you guys have any questions for me? Any big picture questions? Okay, thank you. So Allison Bernie, Falfer Beatty, Community Manager again. We want to just tell you a little bit about what we've been doing since the last town hall, give you kind of a snapshot. Um, from the last town hall and from the surveys that HMO did, we've received uh, 93 action items at different homes. Um, those were, we received multiple action items for some of the homes, but 93 homes that we are addressing action items on. Um, we've completed 73 homes um, that we've had action items on through this process. So we're still working through the process, still working through the homes that are outstanding, but are, we've been actively engaged in talking to those residents and knowing what um, items are still outstanding. Um, to add to that, um, we've also had 100% callback on all of our completed work orders. So one of the things we wanna do is make sure that once those work orders are complete, that we're calling you, we're asking you, hey, did everything get done in your home? Is it completed to your satisfaction? Is there anything else that we need to take care of for you? Um, and if there is, please tell us. I mean, we want to make sure that we get to that point. If we need to come back out and take a look at items, if we need to survey items, we're here and available to do that with you. Um, some of the things we're adding to is um, we heard some feedback that, you know, this maintenance tech came out and took care of this certain situation at our home, but I can't remember his name. You know, and so we want to give you guys the ability to know that, to be able to communicate with us so that we can figure that out. So we're going to start rolling out a maintenance tech business card that has a picture of our maintenance techs and their names. So when they come to your home, they're going to leave that card for you so you can see who was there, who took care of your work order, and so that you can refer back to that um, maintenance tech when you're, when you're talking to us. The other thing we're doing as kind of a QAQC for our team, too, is that we have our maintenance techs taking before and after pictures of all of the work orders. And those are getting uploaded into our work orders so that if there is a question or if there's an issue or if somebody says, hey, I don't think this was done, and we may not be able to run right out and take care of that for you or take a look at it for you, we can drill into that work order and we can see what happened with that maintenance tech and see if we can talk through some of that issue with you and then get it addressed. Um, the other thing we're doing is we've added, um, not only do we have our satisfacts, which is our survey that comes out to you for every single completed work order. We also have um, our comment cards, which we want you to fill out and give us a survey on those. 
but we also have a sheet of paper now that the techs are taking with them where you can actually close your work order. We're soon to hoping to have that be an automated process, but until we have that being an automated process, we are doing the physical manual close of those work orders. So you can tell us, hey, nope, it didn't get completed to my satisfaction, and I want to talk to a supervisor about that. And you check that box on that particular sheet that comes back to us, and we will have a supervisor come and address that issue with you and take care of it, or yes, it was taken care of to my satisfaction, or if you weren't home, then you, the technician will click um, PTE on that, which they had permission to enter and take care of that work order for you. That comes back to our office, and then one of us will call you and ensure that that's been completed and taken care of to your satisfaction. Um, so those sign-up sheets, we've actually started those um, last week, and we've been working those over the last couple of weeks. In March, we completed a total work order count of 742 work orders. It's a lot of work orders. <laughs> um, so we did 742 work orders completed and um, continue to have high ratings on our satisfactory surveys that are coming in from those work orders that have been completed. In addition to that, we've also added some staffing. So we've added one work order technician, uh, I'm sorry, two um, work order uh, full-time maintenance technicians. So those are both, um, we're actually actively recruiting. We've already started hiring one of them. We have another position still to fill. So if you know anybody who's out there interested in the maintenance tech position, I'm putting my plug in. Um, two, we've also added a full-time work order admin position. So in the past, we only had one person who was working our work order admin desk. Now we have two full-time um, people who are working that work order admin desk just to make sure that we have the administrative support to answer the phones, to answer your questions, to work through those work orders, and to keep everything organized and driven in the right direction. Okay. Um, the last thing I just want to kind of talk about is we're continuing to promote the online resident portal for all of our work orders and our tracking and updates. So every new movement that comes in, we're introducing them to that resident portal. We've sent a link out to every single person that lives here and letting them know about that resident portal. We want you to go on there. We want you to sign up for it. We want you to be able to track electronically, as Colonel Beach mentioned, um, your work orders and make sure that you see those to completion. Um, you know, I think that app is a great idea. So um, we'll have to work towards that. Um, so we are working to improve our quality of service too. Um, we've done a lot of QA, QC on our turnovers, um, so we're making sure that those homes are ready. Um, we have a supervisor set of eyes along with our leasing manager who's walking those homes prior to every move in to make sure that they're ready for you. We're doing some additional training with our maintenance staff um, and also our vendors that we're using for those um, turnover <coughs> homes. And then the last thing that I, I heard was mentioned earlier was the pest control. That's another area we're working um, very actively. Um, we've actually taken that up a higher level, and Suzanne, who's my assistant community manager, is handling all pest control. Um, so she's been doing that for the last several weeks, so she can be actively involved as the contact person for any pest management issues that need to be addressed, and she's been following up with those actively. So um, those are some of the things we've done since the last town hall. Uh, on the next slide, um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate the resolution process. We want to resolve your problems. We want to take care of them for you. We do care. We want you guys to live in homes that are safe. And um, so we do have this one, step one, two, three. I know you guys have heard a lot about it. We've all talked about it. But come talk to us if you're having an issue in your home that's unresolved. If we can't resolve it, please talk to HMO. They will come talk to us. And, and we also have the BBC CARES line that you can call if you're not resolved or happy with what is going on, and then um, the Air Force Housing Office also. So all of those are on that slide, um, if you have any questions on that. Does anybody have any questions on any of those items? Okay, that's all we have. Okay, I'll hand this over to Mr. I wanted to just make sure that everybody understands uh, the different roles that we have. I should have mentioned that in the very beginning. But um, we found the last town hall that um, some folks, they see uh, James Fisher, for instance. He's here. I know he's right there. James Fisher. And, <laughs> and he looks great in his tie. But some people might assume, because he's a civilian, that he's actually part of the Balfour Beatty community um, network. And I just wanted to make that clear that we have an, an Air Force network, and we work directly for you. We're advocating for you. We're, I'm responsible as the commander for your health and safety. Um, 
Balfour Beatty is responsible for the maintenance of your home and, and taking care of everything that we uh, need them to do to maintain that health and safety. And then our AFCAC partners, um, Colonel Beach, is responsible for the overall <coughs> portfolio from the military side. So uh, I think that that was coming up in some of the surveys as we were, after the last town hall, we were starting to meet with folks and they were getting confused and who's who and who's, who's doing what. And when they speak to James, um, they're, I just want to make it clear that you're speaking in confidence. You're speaking to a, a military member, a, a government worker, um, not to Balfour Beatty. So if there's any sort of concerns about that, then you have that in our trust. Um, but also, if, uh, if it is a maintenance issue, um, you can certainly tell them and they can advocate on your behalf, but it does help if you follow up with a work order. Then we can actually track it in the system as well. With that, I'll turn it back over to Richard and we'll open it up the, for all your questions. Thank you, ma'am. So what we're going to do is do the open, uh, do the uh, resident open forum. So again, like the last town hall, uh, we want to we want to invite residents to come up. I'll put the mic back over there. You can go on each side. So we do ask that when, when you do come up, you know, definitely uh, express your concerns. But what I also ask, this was some of the feedback that we received from some of the residents at the last town hall, is if you do want to give everybody an opportunity to talk. So it's not that we're trying to not let you talk. But when you do come up, you do want to give other residents an opportunity to talk first before we go back to potentially a second or third time. And then if, in fact, a resident is talking, we ask that don't try to step into their conversation because they're trying to get their issue across from that perspective. So we ask that you at least look at that so we give everybody the opportunity to raise their issues and try to get answers from the folks that we have here. With that, we'll go ahead and... You can start over there if you want, if somebody wants to grab up. So ma'am, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Beth. And um, I just have two questions, I guess, for Balfour Beta. The first one is, uh, what are you doing to keep um, continuity while you're training your new people that you're hiring? And the reason why I asked this is because I called uh, not too long ago for a work order. <clears throat> and the person who uh, answered the phone said that he really couldn't help me in a matter of words. He couldn't help me because y'all were training somebody. So I had to call back and this and that. So what are we doing to uh, mitigate that for the future? That's my first question. Do you want me to ask the second one? Or? Sure, go right ahead. And then the second question is, um, what are you doing to take care of the landscape outside of the fence? area if we live on a green belt. So there's trees and forests and wildlife, but it's high. And so I don't know if landscaping comes out there, but what's the policy on that? Sure, I can take the first question and then I'll let the second question go to Mr. Trevino because outside of our footprint area, which is that perimeter fence, um, we don't maintain. That's maintained by CE in the base. So um, I'll let them take that second question. But the first question is training and continuity. Um, that's a great question. Um, anytime you're training new staff um, and they're coming on board, we have to maintain some type of continuity as we work through those things. And I do apologize that somebody said that to you. We shouldn't have. Um, we want to address your concerns. Um, we do have some new staff members. What we do is we have them ride around with existing staff for several days so that they can see the lay of the land, so that they can see how we work our work orders, they can understand our policies. We spend time with them um, doing both um, webinar type training and then on, on the job training. And then they also spend time with all of our maintenance supervisors, um, each one taking them for several days before we push them out into the field. Um, and you know that process is something that we do consistently with all of our new trainees. We have actually a, an onboarding plan that we use that's for their first 30 days of employment and that we try to get them through every neighborhood, introduce them to the different product types. Because as you can imagine here, we have quite a lot to learn. Um, and it can be overwhelming and intimidating to new people who are coming on. And um, so we really do try to work with them um, through that process um, and get them through that as best we can. If I could, if I could add to that. If I could, if I could add to that. We've also um, hired or are hiring regional facility managers as well. So if there is a vacancy at a given location specifically, 
say with a leader, like a facility manager is rotated out in some way, that there's another means and a person that can backfill uh, and continue continuity. So we're doing that as well. And to address your concern, can you hear me there? To address your concern, to, to address your concern when it comes to the landscaping, we will look at that because that's something that we do want, that we are concerned about. If it's outside of base housing, we can take a look at creating what I consider a buffer zone because you're correct. We don't want to have grass very, very high on the adjacent property of the base because that creates pests coming in, it's snakes, it's spiders, it's ants, it's all those types of things. So if we can get with you afterwards, you can tell us specifically where you're concerned about, and we'll do it on the you know that entire back there, like where we laid the hog traps, that one back fencing on Aaron Scott Village. That's one of the areas that we're already looking at to create uh, a landscape buffer. Because once we do that, we can also lay what we consider a uh, a pest barrier for like scorpions, snakes, those types of things. We can do that to help Balfour Beatty and really the residents to have to keep those uh, pests from coming onto the base housing area. We will take that back as an action, but that's a, that's a valid comment. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Major, was Major Jones? Major Jones. Jones, if you, if you could let um, James know where you live, and then we can follow up. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. And our expectation is to do it not just in your area, but if it's that entire backside, we'll look at the entire backside, or we're with you around the base housing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to come up? Uh, my question is, what is being done about keeping track of the children who now suffer from like, respiratory issues and any autoimmune issues from being exposed to mold? Um, I don't remember if you, if you or I don't know if you remember um, last time I said our kids were sick. And the youngest one is now developing asthma. She's on two inhalers now. And we did get the mold tested, and it is some that um, has sudden onset of, you know, um, asthma in young children. And my oldest now is doing the same thing. She's almost 16. And the pediatrician's been great, and we are um, scheduled for the allergists to see what they can do. And then from the but uh, what's being done about keeping track of these kids who are going to have, you know, these hot long issues? You know, my kids want to go to the military. We have asthma. That's what we want. You know, and it's not, it's not just my kids, too. I mean, I've seen kids who are way worse than mine. You know, so I just want to make sure there's accountability and consistency on that. And uh, also, Mr. Fisher has been great. We've been doing a lot of this. And now I'm more concerned about it. I'll, I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to the medics who, who have probably a little bit more um, of the medical side to it. But first of all, I want to say thank you for coming forward and, and I'm extremely sorry for your, for your health, the health of your kids and what you're going through. Clearly it's an emotional and um, hard time right now. So I would love to talk to you. Maybe we can talk offline and I just want to make sure that you are comfortable in your home and if there's anything that we can do in terms of um, all the remediation that that Balfour Beatty has already done, or if it's something that you're just not comfortable living in that home, we would love to know that. Uh, but in terms of the tracking piece, I think that's a great point, and I haven't heard that comment before. Um, so I would hope um, we are tracking that um, met through our medics. Um, also, maybe perhaps elevating that to our AFCEC uh, team so they're aware of, of where the hotspots are across our portfolio and across the Air Force. Um, but I'll turn it over to Colonel Skinner if you have any more comments. Sure. Uh, so 100% of your every health care visit is tracked. Uh, and it will be tracked constantly. It is an electronic health record that will be developed for every member. And so every visit is tracked, every referral is tracked, every result is tracked. None of that gets lost for that member. 100% is maintained. I guess, my, I guess what I mean more is how is it going to get to the people who need to know, hey, these children are being affected by their living situation. Getting to, I guess, in our case, you know, general literally saying, hey, we got a problem here. You know, um, these kids are sick because potentially they're housing. And following that way, 
Right, so the key piece is being able to link the results of uh, the outcome of the person's health uh, with specifically the living space. And that's exactly what, what you're going through. And that will come back, actually it will come back to my unit, and we will be the ones that will be part of that if it's actually the living space that is deemed to be a confounding factor. It goes back to, um, thank you again for, for coming forward, but it goes back to also, if anyone here, anyone that listens to this town hall later has documentation, and it starts at, you know, when you got to Joint Base San Antonio and you were living in this particular house, um, if we could, if you're willing and you're um, open to sharing that with us, that helps. Um, it helps close the loop because sometimes, yes, it'll be tracked medically, but it might not necessarily make it all the way back to us yeah. unless we re request it. So going to James, letting him know, this is, this is a copy of my doctor's report or redacted, we can, whatever you're comfortable with, and then we can track it and make sure that we're elevating that to Balfour Beatty as well um, so they understand which homes are more susceptible. And then likewise, um, making sure that your kids have it documented at our level.
because I'm a lack. I should see lack. But lack does not qualify because I'm armed. That's not fair to my children. And that's not fair to me. Y'all all do the same thing. Thank you. So was Elizabeth? Yes. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, if I could, for your last point about the uh, hearts of heart, um, Colonel Field, if you could follow up with that, because I think that's something that we can fix pretty quickly. Um, so I apologize that, that you didn't get the services either here or at Fort Sam because of being joint in your, sounds like your army. Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we will, we owe that back to you how, what happened and how we're going to fix it. To the other point about your house, um, I think that's one of the great things about what's happening now is that you have, hopefully you have a, a voice and you can come to us when you're having, if, if you feel like you've been in a home that's not healthy for your children and nothing's happening or all of a sudden you discover um, backwash or black mold or um, some sort of unsafe condition. Um, and it sounds like they did move you quickly once that happened, but to your greater point is why did it come to that? And, and that's the good thing about today and this survey is that now we know, especially your home, and we can go back and I'll ask our team to specifically go back to your house right now, check with the people that are in it, and if we haven't visited with them, then we will, and make sure that they have um, no health concerns or they, their children, whatever ages they are, are, are driving and not having gone through what you've gone through. To the health piece though, I would ask Colonel Skinner if there's anything if you have anything to add to what her kids have experienced up to this point. Not really, ma'am. I mean, that's... So, uh, are you getting the pediatric care and support that your your kids need? That's we are now. Line. When we first moved here, we were staying at Wolfer Hall when it was the old Wolfer Hall. Okay. And every time we go in, we see a new doctor. We never yes. saw the same one. We have to say the same story over again. They want to run the same test again. And after six months old, I was like, this is not okay. My newborn son should not consistently be sick. And when I travel back home, my kids start to get better. And then I come back to my home where we live, and they're getting sick again. I'm like, it's the home. And then that's when the whole backwash happened. And the doctors were like, oh, we don't need to test now because proof. Okay. Uh, well, there's a couple of disconnects there because uh, it still is a, a concern for you and for your your child, uh, and that's so that part still should be followed up on regardless because the situation can occur uh, in the future of whatever that allergen may be, uh, and making sure that that's being taken care of appropriately uh, to ensure the best future of health as possible for you and for your child. Okay. And then I also like to say I'm, I'm a walking mom. I like to walk my daughter to school. I live on post. Our street lights don't work half the time. It gets real dark in Texas sometimes. And these people are driving real fast. Stay late. Because it's okay to drive 15 in the housing area, which normally they're doing but I've got to slow down if I'm past an active duty anymore. I'd rather by driving 10 miles an hour past a kid playing on the street, because he's not going to know better than a grown man in uniform who knows better than on the street. I think the speed limits need to be lower in the housing areas. And I've seen the security forces, and they're stopping people in the neighborhoods now, but they can't be everywhere all the time. And if feelings were lower, <laughs> maybe people would slow down some more. I live on a curb. It's scary. Like, I have to park my truck on the curb and my car on the other side of the curb. So people slow down because they're scared to hit the truck. So my kids don't get hit when they're playing. And on my street, almost every house has children, and we all play outside, and we all have the same complaint that people fly down our street with no remorse, no care. And we have children that jet in front of cars think it's funny. It's not funny. Somebody's gonna get hurt, and who's gonna get fault? So, I would like Richard, it, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. 
Um, Richard will address the street lights, and it might be part, part Balfour Beatty, depends on where the street light is, I think. Right, so that's correct, ma'am. So what we'll do is we'll work with Balfour Beatty, so whether it's us or them, we'll ensure that the street lights get fixed. If it's ours that we'll do, or if it's in our property, we'll take care of that. Otherwise, we'll work with Balfour Beatty and see what we can do to try to get them fixed, because yeah. lighting is part of the safety factor. I agree. You said you live on, was it Macy? I, I live on Elizabeth Longley now. Okay. I used to live on Macy. Okay. So we the street lights by the commissary that walk to the school. Those lights didn't work all last year. Okay. Because if it's on, on base proper, that's my responsibility. I can fix those. Even if it's lights leading up to base housing, if they're off, I should fix those to where there's clear line of sight going into base housing. If it's something we'll work with Balfour Brady, if it's theirs, we'll work with them as well. So I'll, I'll ask that my team get with you if, if you can highlight specifically where you have your concerns, we'll, and we'll have our guys out. That's mine, we'll have them out there tomorrow. That's not an issue. Oh. And then the security, do you want to speak to that, Doug, at all? So I, I can tell you, uh, we, we've been targeting the neighborhoods off and on, uh, but we target it when we know the kids are out. So in the mornings, uh, when they're going to school, in the evenings when they're coming home, and then at night when you're asleep, we're out patrolling around making sure the neighborhoods are safe. Uh, during the day, for the most part, we're out where you all are, right, in the community. So, um, but if you do have concerns, you can always reach us, uh, whether you're calling BDOC or emailing us direct, uh, whether it's me or, or the folks you know. And, you know, my airmen, my defenders live in your neighborhoods too. And ask them. And, uh, you know, we do a monthly patrol matrix where we target certain spots. And if it's becoming a hot spot for you, let us know and we'll add that into the matrix. And then, you know, we target for a while, it'll stop. We pull out, then it'll start up a few months later. You know, we can play that game. Uh, but let us know if it's a hot spot or concern, and we'll definitely get out there and force. Okay. Adam Walmart. There is a huge puddle on the way to school. They're digging it up now. I call it the doo doo puddle. It's this thing, it smells like sewage. It's been there since we moved here. And they fixed it last year, and now the puddle's bigger and huge. They just dug up the big hole they had to up. There was kids climbing on it the other day. It fell in that hole. It, I mean, it would be the kids' fault, but it wouldn't be pretty. Nobody's out there making sure nobody can get in that hole. The mama in me was like, get off that fence. You know better, go to school. And he listened. But some kids aren't going to listen. They walk to school on their own. It's kind of scary and it stinks the high heavens. I don't know if you've been by it. It, it smells worse than a barn. Um, what is it? Is it sewage? Is it something that's been exposed and kids have been running through it? Is this another health concern we need to be concerned about? So, so most likely it's it is a it's most likely a probably a sewer line that needs to be repaired. So there's not a, too much of a health issue. Because if it's been exposed that long, we have to do the repairs and we probably reroute it. I'll have, if we can get with James, with the street lights and the piping, we will fix that. Um, if it's tied to a contract that is outside of what we're responsible for, we'll work to see if, if we can do some type of temporary fix on it. Um, some of the work that we have, we are doing some repairs to our source systems by contractor instead of my own guys doing it. So we we'll just have to make sure which part of it it, it actually is. But we'll figure out a solution one way or If it means even if we have to put a plate on top where kids cannot crawl into it, we'll do that at a very Because it's right in front of the youth center. So we yes, walk right past it. <coughs> and that holds at least, it's a, got a six foot ladder in it right now that's not even to the top of the hole. Yes, ma'am. So that, that kid would be very hurt and most likely can't get out. Yes, ma'am. So, worst case is we, typically the, the fence is there as part of the safety issue, but if we do have kids climbing on it, then the, really the alternative is we just put an actual steel plate down. We're not going to pick it up. We need a, really a forklift to really to do that or an actual front end loader. That should solve it temporarily until we can actually get it repaired. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. So just piggyback on that, I have seen that fence. And uh, per OSHA, I'm a safety professional. I work at the 24th Air Force. Uh, that your contractor, yeah, yeah, he needs to, because if somebody calls that in, there's actually no markings on that fence at all, and that's a big federal OSHA bad juju. Um, I want to just come, cover a couple of things. I know that last last week I last. Um, 
town hall, thank you. I did not, maybe I missed it, I did not get the uh, survey, the water survey results. You tell me the water is good, but I've been stationed at Holman, they told me that there too. And uh, I just want to be clear 10, 20 years down the road that I don't have a fin going out of my tail, out of my rear. So along with that, I know that I had asked a request to developer Beatty what collectively million dollar project about putting our old systems, because on average, I, I spent for my family between 80 and $100 a month on just water, whether it be with the water system or if we go get Costco water bottles, because the water, although it may be safe, it tastes like food. It's not very good. And if you look at the, the zero water um, geography on, on any filter, the water here in Texas is really bad compared to the ones that we just PCS from Alaska. Water in Alaska was one of the best. So here is one of the worst. The filter lasts me about six days. Um, I know that's something that we had mentioned last time about PMIs. Is that something that I've not heard anybody talk about PMIs and how to get ahead of these issues for everything we've heard tonight. I know that your, your maintenance team do does the best job they can with what the, the level of people they have, but there's got to be, we got to get ahead of it, I think. Um, Ms. Suzanne, she did phenomenal. I know I told the general here that shortly after our meeting last time, uh, I said, there was a gentleman said he got, their son got bit by a snake. I'm like, hey, I see snakes. As I get home, on my front door, there was a snake right there just hanging out. So Ms. Suzanne, I called her and she took care of it within uh, five days. He had the exterminator out, out there. Um, I remember Colonel Thompson, Thomas? That he and I, uh, I, I met him at, uh, as a safety professional, I talked to the traffic working, traffic safety working group, and that's something that we discussed that security forces was supposed to do, and especially in senior NCO housing and throughout, throughout the base, to put that radar machine. I've actually, I walk my dog every day, twice a day, and I've actually screened that, that 2016 gray uh, Jeep Cherokee and I went back and I actually talked to him because he was flying through there. And this was at 6.30 when all the kids are out. So, uh, you know, I know you're doing it, Colonel, but maybe perhaps a little more, I don't know. I and mean, we should know as senior NCOs, we should know better, but we still need Big Brother looking out. Um, and lastly, the street uh, markings. I know, I know that something I discussed last time was the, the, the streets, the roads, they're, you know, they're in ill repair throughout the, the installation. I know it's big, big dollars. But in the meantime, how about repainting those? Because some of the crosswalks are faded, you can't see, uh, both on base and immediately off the base. I mean, you've got a, a right turn only, that you've got one, one side, one uh, paint marker, but that's it, no more, and the rest are faded. So I know I've said a lot, so I will leave you to it. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll work through the traffic safety working group to, to prioritize the crosswalks. So we try to do is focus the crosswalks that we have, high pedestrian traffic, base housing, schools, CDCs, youth centers, commissary, VX, those types of things. Also where we have high uh, traffic in terms of administrative facilities, we'll go back and look to see through the traffic safety working group, where are those potential areas? And we'll have to just put those on a cycle of preventive maintenance to just maintain that painting. Yes, sir. I'm not requesting. I'm not asking for a new one. Just no, no, no. Just, just, painting just taking the ones that we currently have and repainting them because those should be on a cycle because paints fade over time. Yes, and then at that point, the uh, crosswalks, people don't see them, and that becomes an issue. So that's my responsibility outside of base housing to make sure that we do that, and we'll put that as part of our preventive maintenance. I can answer the water piece. Let me know where you live. I can talk to you directly about water sampling results. There's something that's, that's out there online. I know there was, but they said they were going to send it out, and maybe I just didn't see it. Okay. So I can, I mean, I can send you out what's called the Consumer Confidence Report, yes, which is the mandatory requirement uh, by the EPA. It's due every year. The new one will be out before July 1st of this year uh, for 2018. But anything that you want as far as the representative samples for your area where your house is, I can supply those as well. Talk to them. Thank you, sir. And 
And I'll share as a result of the traffic safety working group, we did share with CE some of the crosswalks that, that we saw that, that were fading. And some of the feedback was if, if weather uh, stays, stays dry, they do have plans to start some of that next, next week. And we'll make sure, we'll take a look at the list, make sure it covers all, all we, we can talk afterwards, just make sure we're, we're tracking the areas that you're seeing. And I'll touch on a couple of things that you also brought up. The water softeners, we did address and we're talking about that internally, um, you know, about hard water and that sort of thing. So I haven't come to a conclusion yet, but we are discussing that. Um, preventative maintenance, um, I can't remember if I said that last time, but the, you know, we are piloting a third party preventative maintenance uh, program and taking a look at that, um, which it'll be, that will be the only function that the, that outfit does for us and it'll free the text to uh, turn work orders, that sort of thing. Um, for street markings, if, if there are some in housing, you know, that need to be done, just let us know. But we do every year go through and assess which ones need to be painted, crosswalks, et cetera. Um, I know we do the one over by Zachary that's being demoed right now um, pretty frequently because that seems to get worn out. So if, uh, you know, if you see some street markings or uh, just bring it to our attention and we'll address it. so that we do have on stock our most common parts that do break in our HVAC systems. We have a variety of different systems that are out there, um, so we do try to stock several of each, um, are, which are the common parts that often break on these systems. Inevitably, it'll always be a common part that we don't have yeah. on the shelf that will break. And some of these systems are coming to their life expectancy also. And so we've been replacing whole systems regularly um, as they come up to that life expectancy. And we just can't um, part them anymore. But um, we do order everyday parts. We are um, on service with both Johnstone Carrier and HD Supply. They know us by first name. Um, as far as getting supplies and parts for our HVAC units. And we have an inventory control procurement person who does just that. His job, 40 hours a week, is just to make sure we're stocked with supplies to be able to service these homes. So I do understand. Um, the other thing that we do do if your HVAC goes out and we're not able to fix it that night is we have portable ACs that we do put in those homes. Um, and so those portable ACs that we check out to the residents to be able to give them some relief from that heat in those homes when they're not available. Um, if we run out of portable ACs and we're not able to do that, we also have a hospitality suite um, that we can put you or an airman in um, that should have a working AC at all times um, so that um, that's not an issue. So we do try to have some plan B, C um, if we run into those situations. Um, 
June, July, August are, are tough months for us. We um, go through quite a, a few calls. Sometimes we've had nights where we've had 30 and 40 calls um, that have come in for HVAC. Um, so sometimes those are more than what we have available, and so we try to work through those situations with each of the families. Sam, I wonder if there's, um, as a backup to the backup plan, if there's some sort of relief, if it's the Air Force Assistance Fund or something through the Military Family Readiness Center that might be available for folks? We can look at that too. Thank you. I did forget one thing that we just added because I, I don't know why we just added it. So um, we actually have gone and secured um, accounts with two um, hotels off base should there ever be an emergency and we don't have enough space and or equipment to handle that particular situation. We do have the ability to put people up in hotels if we need to. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. I just forgot we did that. <laughs> other questions? Okay, General, Allison, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Uh, you mentioned the uh, Tenants Bill of Rights last time we were up here. I know it was uh, on the screen earlier. How close are we to having that roll out? Great question. Excellent, excellent question. So it remains in the future, right? So it's at the service secretary level, right? The uh, the Air Force is now the lead service for putting together the Senate Bill of Rights. Uh, this, I believe it's over with Congress now for their comments, and the uh, and so once we those, once they get those comments back, it'll be uh, some amount of time after that before it gets rolled out. But we are making progress, and it, and it is at a at a very senior level. That's that's helpful. Helpful. I'm sorry, I don't have a date. But they, I asked them that we'll give one. Just just hadn't heard anything about it. That's perfect. Thank right, you. Right your slide had some of the things that would be in the Bill of Rights, correct? Or do you want, can you talk to that again? Uh, my slide did have avocado in my slide to do it <laughs> in a throwaway. But basically, uh, the uh, Bill of Rights, the, uh, the one of them is, yeah, read the Bill of Rights. You know, making sure you understand you have, uh, what's the right way to put it? So there was a, if you watch the hearings, right, there's a, a, a pretty strong desire for a way for tenants to withhold rent to the owner if uh, standards are, are not met, right? The, uh, there we go. The, uh, so that's, that's probably one of the toughest ones to get in terms of landlord tenant law, right? Because there's 50 states, 50 different interpretations, and a lot of landlord tenant law does not really allow you to do that, but I can evict it. So, uh, we're opening yourself up to the possibility of being convicted, I should say, right? The, uh, so that, that's kind of a sticky one. Some of the others up there, you know, as far as uh, an advocate for housing, we're, we're presenting a manpower bill to the Air Force uh, to the, on the order of 30 million to staff a resident advocate at every installation, right? So this person would not work in the, in the housing management office, that would be separate, kind of like a patient advocate is kind of the model at the clinic that we're, that we're trying to implement. But a person that, you know, they're not involved with day-to-day -day management of the housing project that, uh, to which they might become uh, partial one way or another, right? So you want to have a, a neutral outside person that understands the rules of uh, landlord tenant law for that particular site. Uh, has the year of the commander, has uh, access to resources at a pretty senior level to work issues that come up, right? Many, a lot of these issues that come up are not, they're not one-sided, right? They're kind of complex. So um, to be able to work those in a timely manner so that people can go back to doing the mission and not be focused on their housing. The uh, responsive communication and prompt repairs, you know, those are kind of hand in glove, right? Like, as you guys have, I've articulated here, right? You, you want to know that your work order is is in and you want to be communicated with, with, you know, whether it's, nope, I don't have to lay in my bed and sweat. I have an opportunity to go get a hotel or whatever, right? There's uh, an effort. So we want to have responsive communications and also a uh, the dispute resolution process. As I talked about before, I think this site probably has, at least you have a written down process. Not every site has a written down process, 
but we want to have a robust written down process that uh, that is transparent and, and you, you sign up to it when you sign your lease right you know what you're getting into when at the beginning it's not sprung on you later and it's uh, you know fair and objective and then yeah, withholding of EAH, we already talked about that one and uh, yeah, the, some of the easy ones privacy right, definitely you know you should have a they shouldn't be selling your information right they, uh, uh, and then predict, predictable rent and fees that's all you know, pretty straightforward the other big one that uh, I didn't talk about earlier was move in and move out procedures right sometimes uh, uh, there's a lot of reporting of uh, a lot of charges potentially excessive charges uh, charge that move out right like I move out and I'm kind of you know you're in you know, ECF a bunch of times right you're in I got to get to my next place mode the U-Haul is packed or the movers are I'm trying to do it door to door so I don't have really the time to, to litigate this uh, what, what did my car look like before I got here so we want to codify that and have a rigorous process where that is clearly understood and it's deliberate and it's not a, it's not last minute ad hoc it's a uh, it's fair to the project and to the to the person that's lived there. Okay, you're only charged for what you actually. If you do have a damage, you should be charged to repair that damage, right? Not well, you know, on average that costs 500 bucks, but in your case it costs 200. So I'm going to charge you 500, and then something, you know, like no, 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 none of that, right? It should be a uh, auditable process where your charges are. Uh, they should be able to explain to you and show that that, that work was done. Is that helpful? Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to offer from the legal office perspective and to give you a pitch is while they're working on this Bill of Rights or we'll see what comes of that, my office is here to help you in any way interpret Texas landlord tenant law because all of that does currently apply to you, help you interpret your lease, walk you through the, the dispute resolution process. Uh, our number is 671-3362 and I have cards so you don't have to remember that or I don't have to say it 17 times. If you want one, just come talk to me. I um, mean, my office has been directed to, if it's a base housing issue, we are going to prioritize that and immediately get y'all in to talk to an attorney. Sometimes you're surprised as to what the actual laws um, apply and how they apply, but you can have a free one-on-one -on -one talking to an attorney to help walk you through, explain your options, help you draft um, documents that you want to provide, all of those things we can help you do. So, and that applies. Um, even for Army people, active duty, independents that are entitled to legal assistance, no matter what service you are, would be entitled to legal assistance in my office or any of the um, offices if you'd rather go to Fort Sam or Randolph. Please. All right. He reminded me of something. I'm not sure if this is directed at you or who, but um, not so much for us because our issues have not been as bad as some of these people over here. But I. I come up against being prior military and military where we'll see something is wrong and occasionally we're told that's just how it is. And military are like, well, where's the order on that to back yourself up before you go to somebody and say this is wrong when they're telling you it's right? Where is the where are the regs? as far as if you have mold in your house or you have sewage backup and they're saying they're not gonna replace your carpet, where do you go to say, no, these are the standards that need to be upheld just because you don't want to do this or you know, we can't prove something for people to look to look up and come up with. So as far as the regs, there's not necessarily a regulation, but there is the Texas landlord tenant law that applies. There are some good websites out there and stuff, but again, I would encourage you is we would have access to LexisNexis and Westlaw to actually, no kidding, pull the statutes um, and walk you through is also we have, um, there are organizations downtown and stuff that put out handbooks and stuff like that that aren't necessarily the regs per se, but help explain um, the rules and what they're required to do under Texas law. And then even if that doesn't necessarily apply, um, the, the attorneys in my office or anybody else's offices, even if necessarily that's not required necessarily by the law, there are still, they can help you request because there might be a, a requirement to make this habitable. And that's gonna be very, very, very fact specific. So it's hard for me to give you, a, but that's why 
again, I would, I would highly encourage you to come talk to an attorney and with those facts, they can help, help you through that. Is there just suggestion request, a way to give new tenants, incoming people, a list of websites as references instead of just depending on a lease that doesn't necessarily refer to they're using the wrong caulking on your bathtub and mold keeps growing underneath and you can't clean it off and they're telling you that's the right caulking. By and large, I haven't had many issues with the maintenance guys, but I have had someone stand there and tell me that's just how it is in this area. You just have snakes and scorpions and that hole where the hose is going to the back of your house and there's no tape around it that's just how it is. Uh, snakes can't get into your house like that. I'm sorry, I'm born and raised in Texas. It can happen. It has happened. Right. Um, so maybe just provide people a resource without having to make it get to the point of going the legal, I guess. I don't really, it's not a question so much. It's just Suggestion. where do we look up what standards are as opposed to what we're being told or what the lease says. So we do have some pamphlets at the legal office that you could, I know you said to avoid going to legal, but we do have some pamphlets with materials that we can put together that we might be able to send out to you. Uh, but again, I would encourage you, I know it's not, you don't have time every, every um, second of every day to come sit down and talk to a lawyer, uh, but I would encourage you to do that. But um, I did just want to talk to, it, it is very, very important though, as far as those websites, but what, no kidding, is in your lease, that can also control too as what, because it is a contractual agreement between the parties. So um, it's gonna be important for somebody to look at that too, because that may be, there are certain things that you can opt out or in of, and there's certain things where, no kidding, this is the law, you have to provide it. You can't opt out of that, um, and we can help you interpret. And this is, this doesn't just apply to base housing. I mean, we, de we deal with this all the time where someone's not getting their security deposit or someone in a downtown um, rental situation. So this applies um, no matter where you go. Um, but obviously with base housing, it would apply as well, but it's no different. There's a, a lease, a contractual agreement that's been created. We can help you interpret it. <laughs> I think that's a. I think you're hitting on something though. That and, and James, I don't know if we do this already, but when people move in, do you send them a welcome email and contact information? And that might well, we be. Don't, we don't get that in depth. That's what, what you got. But it might be an opportunity though to kind of have a, a, a fact sheet. These are your resources. You've got legal. You've got when we when we get our advocates advocates and when all these things start. Receive any of that information? I had no idea what like office, phone numbers, names, okay. locations, I knew none of that. That's great feedback. So we can tighten up our processes too and, and kind of a new new day, a new day. So we'll start we'll start making sure we have that opportunity and we'll build, we'll build a repository of, of facts and resources that we can send to new residents. And, and this doesn't get to the extent of, of what you're getting after, but recognizing from the first town halls, a lot of people didn't recognize that there's a a government housing office as a liaison and, and advocate um, and as a result of that immediately after that first town hall we added a, a slide briefing that at the newcomers briefings so to talk about the uh, escalation process and that you do have a government office here that is your, your advocate um, for your family housing just real quick to that like she's army we're marine corps we didn't have like the newcomers brief necessarily for we that didn't have the so, and he's Intel, so he doesn't work on main base. So it's kind of one of those things where we aren't necessarily introduced to all of the resources. So I understand it's not on the management office, but maybe working with so that in our leasing packet, some of that stuff is included. I feel like a lot of times there's younger wives that maybe it's their first time leaving home and they don't know to even look for the resources. And, um, so I find myself occasionally saying, hey, you know, here's some numbers or send some emails and see these people and maybe you'll be more likely to get some help. Right, so and you're correct. So although you're not an Air Force person and you may get it as what Colonel Thompson was saying to the newcomers, as part of our referral process, going back to what General Linderman is saying, we can steer, as you 
get a copy of your lease and get all the documents, we will find ways to get that information to you. And that's, that's going to be incumbent upon us, whether we take the same information that's in the newcomer's briefing, take some of the data that the legal folks have, we can package something up, and then we can send it out as part of the referral. That's really what General Lindemann's talking about, is we can tighten that up. For us, it doesn't matter whether you're Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, it just doesn't matter. You're right. a resident, you're our family, you're our customer, we'll send that out to you. We have to sign a rules and regulation page when we sign our lease. Yes, and it tells us we can be out till 10 p.m. and loud as we want, then we got to quiet because time to go to bed. And we can't do this, we can't park here, we can't spray paint this, we can't do that. Is there, I think what she's getting to is there needs to be a rules and regulation in that lease that housing is held to the standard as well. Because, like she said, there is no XYZ for that for housing, but there is for us, we sign it, and there are lots of wives who are new and don't know what they can, I'm a young wife, but I luckily we came from a unit that had all these resources and was very vocal about it, and when I sought those resources, I was very scammed away with, oh, we don't do that. Right, but I think, I think like rules and regulations should be in place for housing, like, that way we see it in it. This is their rules and regulations and the standard that the military is holding them to because y'all paying them a lot of money for these houses. Like yes, our full BAH, not partial. Yes, ma'am. And I think that's what's back to what Colonel Beach has indicated. The Air Force is looking at ways that we can uh, provide that oversight. You know, the Tenant Bill of Rights, uh, increased oversight, things that we can do as an Air Force, but still also still be legal within the, the the lease agreements that we have, we are looking at those types of things. What can we do? So if it is a valid concern, the, that's the benefit of the town halls. We're able to bring that back, you know, through the Air Force corporate structure to say, can we do anything, yes or no? So that's a, that's a valid concern. But even outside of that, we can still provide that as part of our referral packet, those helpful hints. So even if you, even if there's not a checklist to say, what is DVC required to do, we can still give you those resources to at least come to us and, and, and ask us, right. Well, and also, as our as Colonel Thompson indicated, you have an advocate in terms of the Air Force. So James Fisher and his staff is your advocate. If you work with BBC and you can't come to resolution, we are your advocate. We will sit down with BBC and yourself and try to come to resolution. Yeah. That is that is what my staff job is to do. Yeah, I had no idea that you guys existed. I didn't I Yes, ma'am. So that's why, going back to what General Lemon and Colonel Thompson said, there was confusion, and I think there still is to some respect. So that's incumbent upon me and my staff to do a better job of communicating to you that we are your advocate. So when you go to Francis, although she sits, she's co-located with BBC, Francis is my employee. She's the referral, she's the Air Force referral specialist there to help you. And if you go to James Fisher or Elvira, you're going to an Air Force, you're going to a military person. That is your advocate. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, doesn't matter. We are here to support you. Who do playgrounds fall under? Is that the Bermudis or is that civil? If it's internal to the base housing, it's Balfour Beatty. If it's outside of base housing, then it's me. So internal, the Raymond Lozano loop, that play area in there, uh, we've been playing at it since we've lived in Elizabeth Wonky. It's had the same hole in the, the slide for the whole two years, nobody's ever fixed it. It's got vulgar writing on it. You know, a kid wrote it. It says poop, and they think it's a bad word. But it's never been cleaned up. Nobody ever fixed the hole. I know I'm not the only one that's complained about it, but who, like, who does that one, like, who fixes that? So, so all those playgrounds do fall under us. We do playground inspections. Um, if this is something that's come up, we will absolutely get out there and take a look at it. Um, we often have to scrub playgrounds um, with graffiti on them 
and we do try to work through those issues. Um, we go and remulch those playgrounds annually to make sure that that's all been done. You said there's a hole in the concrete? No, it's in the slide, the spiral slide. Okay. And it's in the bottom of that slide, as well as there's new puddles by that mark. That nobody, that literally the entrance for the, the handicap accessible for the wheelchairs come through, literally rolls through a puddle of sewage water. And we'll get, been we'll get somebody out there well. to take a look at that playground. And and just to your other point on the um, knowledge of the staff, I, mean, I haven't been here all three years, so that's probably why you didn't know me. But um, we are working to improve that too, because that was feedback we got from the last town hall. And so in each of our move-in packets going forward, we're going to have our pictures with our titles and contact information in those move-in packets so that doesn't occur again. Okay. Thank you. Folks, real quick, can you please make sure that when you have questions that you do use the microphone so the audio can be properly recorded? Many people may have the same questions or concerns you do. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, kind of piggybacks on what they were saying. Um, I don't know if it's a legal question or if it's a documentary question. You know, a lot of times uh, we would hear, well, it's not toxic, it's black mold, it's not black mold. No, it's not black mold, but the mold that's in our house, it's affecting us. And legally, I guess, um, company policy-wise, or wise, they are upholding their company policy because it's not black mold, but when we're uncomfortable in our house and it's affecting our health, um, where can, or I guess, um, about the whole issue about where can we go to check facts, um, can there be something added in that to, yeah, it's, it's, they're upholding the law, I guess they're doing lawful things, but here is your right as a resident to live in your house comfortably, or, you know, something like that, something along that line. I think um, that's a great point, and that's kind of where we're at right now with a lot of families um, over at Randolph where, yeah. Um, we're meeting the standard, whatever that standard is, but it's still causing health issues within their family. So we're working with all that Colonel Vince kind of address it. Thank you, ma'am. So there are, as far as what are the rules and regulations, there are handouts out there, Texas um, resident landlord tenant laws and things like that, but I would still then encourage you to come in and talk to an attorney that can look up the specific issues, because some of these are, uh, the, the laws are very voluminous at times and things like that. So. Um, but even though they're voluminous, they might not speak to a specific, um, this type of black mold or this type, it might not be down to that level. There's, there's a standard, typically it's a standard of, of habitability, um, and the attorney can help walk through and make arguments on your behalf to say this does make it inhabitable and here's why, and can argue with that, whether it's with this lease or any other lease. Um, so I, I don't mean to be evasive in my answer, but it's just a lot of it is there are, they write the law, but then the law is open to interpretation and arguments. And so if you come in and talk to that attorney and give them the facts as to <coughs> this is happening and that, they can then write letters for you, they can uh, arm you with a argument or your options as far as how you can argue this does need to be corrected and here's why. Um, another thing, and this maybe speaks to your point a little bit, is there's nothing wrong with, I know sometimes, and I can relate, I'm getting ready to PCS as well, but we're trying to find the right place to live and, and get the lease and this and that. But you can, if you have time, ask for that future lease, ask it and bring that lease in to the legal office and meet with an attorney and see if they have concerns. Um, they'd have to look up if you're PCSing to Oklahoma or DC or wherever it might be and can look up that law and see if they see anything that's concerning to them. Sometimes you have to make a tough choice where you're like, hey, I want that house and I just have to sign. But if those concerns keeping up for you, that there's there's nothing wrong with getting a copy. Once you've actually signed the document, then we're gonna be working within the four corners of that document. We can help you then interpret the terms and the laws that apply to that agreement, but now we have an agreement. But before you sign an agreement, nothing wrong with getting a copy of that and asking. I, I actually, I do it and I'm an attorney. I walked, hey, I just wanted your opinion on this before I sign this. My landlord's trying to sell my house and this is what they want me to agree to. 
I ask somebody in my office that's more experienced in this than me to get their opinion. There's nothing wrong with you doing that as well before you sign the document. But we can help you interpret the document once you sign it too. Okay. And my thing is, um, what, I, what I want people to understand is, um, especially the housing company, is that just because it is a toxic mold doesn't mean it's not toxic <coughs> to the residents. Um, you might be allergic to dogs. I'm not. I can be around dogs. You can't. My kids can't be around this mold, but other kids can. And I mean, no kid should have to be around it because it's a potential hazard. But you know, it's on a case by case basis, not what company policy is. That's that's what I'm trying to really nail, you know, to them right now is yes, it's not as bad as, as it could be, but it's bad for us. So that's just what I want everybody else to know too that every situation is different, and we don't compare journeys, you know. Your story might be smaller than ours, but it's still, you're having issues, and everybody needs to come together and hold to get this thing care of. Thank you. Any other questions? With that, Matt, we'll, well, if there are any more questions, um, this is an ongoing forum. This is not the end or the last one. We'll continue to have opportunities for folks to come forward and, and make sure that you get your questions answered in a public way. Um, but most importantly, we wanted to say thank you for coming in tonight and sharing your stories. Um, thank you for being um, a part of our community. And uh, thanks for raising our, your, your concerns to our level so that we can help every Valpar Beatty and help all of us be a little bit more aware of what's going on improve our processes, so thank you for your suggestions. And, and to your point, you know, every family is unique and everybody is different. And I agree, my husband's very sensitive, like his skin and, and things that don't affect him, me at all affect him in a very different way and we live in the same house together. Um, so we're, we're, I'm very aware and I take your point. Um, and I, I think, you know, just listening to Ty and Allison, I, it, I think they're open to that too. Um, and, and I would encourage you, if, if there's things in your home that, that are just not being resolved, and come to them, come to James, and let's see what we can do. Um, I don't want to sign anybody up for anything, but there might be options for us. Okay. No, we are. We're in the process. Okay, good. Very good. All right, then with that, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, we appreciate you for being here, and I hope you all have a great night. Thank you.